trying to find my unmute button there. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I think so. It's a little hard for me to tell, given all the screens, and we're in different rooms. So I'm going to go with a yes. Okay. <laughs> I know so I'm I gonna, Bob Percy on, and as long as Bob's on, we're all set. <laughs> okay. I'm going to reconvene the meeting of the board. And um, John, I see you have uh, several members who are going to testify today. So if you could just introduce them, and then I'm going to ask Joanne to um, swear you all in as a group. Okay, sounds good. Um, we, we, that's our third slide, but I'm going to jump ahead and do that now just so you know who everybody is. Um, so for the NVRH leadership team today, um, Sean Burroughs, our CIO, who's actually away on vacation in Alaska, so he won't be joining us, uh, but he was a major contributor. We don't have to swear him in. We have Diana Gibbs, um, our new VP of Community Health Improvement and Marketing. This is her first uh, presentation, the Green Mountain Care Board. Betty Ann Guatkin, um, our Chief HR Officer, who is joining us also from her vacation. Uh, Bob Hersey, of course, you all know quite well, our Chief Financial Officer. <clears throat> Laura Newell, our VP of Operations and Medical Practices. Uh, Dr. Michael Roos, our Chief Medical Officer. Um, and uh, Julie Schneckenberger, our Chief Nursing Officer. Colleen Sinan, who is our VP of Quality Management Programs, and of course, myself, uh, the CEO of NVRH. Okay, Joanne, could you swear them all in? Sure, would you all please raise your right hands? Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thanks. And Sean, whenever you're ready to, to proceed, uh, take it away. Okay, you got it. I think uh, we're going to let uh, Bob open a little bit with a review of the um, agenda. So the agenda that we have, uh, and good afternoon, by the way, uh, will follow exactly the format that uh, was suggested by the Greenmount Care Board. Uh, so we'll go to slide four now, uh, and we'll give an overview of NVRH. Uh, we are an independent 25-bed critical access hospital. We've been a critical access hospital since 2004. Our service area, which includes about 30,000 population, includes all of Caledonia County uh, and Southern Essex County as well. Our budgeted ED visits for 2022 are 12,500, uh, which, by the way, we're down from about 16,000 uh, ED visits in 2019. We operate 14 medical practices, uh, multiple specialty practices, and four rural health clinics. We have currently 684 employees. Of that, 80 are either physicians or advanced practice providers. Of the 684, 394 are part-time, and 290 are full-time. And our mission is to be a leader in improving the health of our community. Next. An introduction to our fiscal 22 budget, um, a snapshot at the 35,000 foot level. Uh, we're budgeting an operating margin of just over $2 million, or about 2% of our total operating revenue. We are requesting a 3% average charge increase. We continue to expand and add services in order to meet the, the needs of our community. Uh, we continue our focus on reducing avoidable you know, ED visits. And for 2022, we will be expanding our visit, uh, participation in value-based payment programs. Uh, next, I am going to turn it back to Sean, who is going to make a few introductory comments. Sean? Thanks a lot. Uh, the picture wasn't my idea, but the uh, bears behind me are what I look like in the morning before coffee. I did prepare a couple of. bad that you didn't uh, go there to make the presentation. It would have been kind of neat to have uh, stand on that bench. That's next right. Year. Next year. <laughs> uh, the Fairbanks Museum is one of the gems of St. Johnsbury. Um, uh, Kevin, I did prepare a couple opening remarks, so bear with me as I uh, uh, talk our way through these. Um, first, I just want to open by saying just how proud I am of my staff and the whole team here at NVRH for their hard work and the commitment to our patients while navigating this pandemic over this past year. And I also want to give a special shout out to the staff who uh, set up the programs that really helped us prevent the spread of COVID in our communities, 
for example, our testing centers, the vaccination programs, and the screening centuries that have become a central function of how we operate as a hospital um, in this new world. I think I also want to uh, highlight something that you'll see in the data coming up, but uh, we've been very pleased with our new express care clinics that we opened in partnership with Northern County's Healthcare, and we also rolled out during this past pandemic year. Um, they're already having an impact on avoidable ED visits, and we're excited to see that result. Now, given all that positive, um, I'll be honest with you, you know, it's been tough to uh, have to prepare this presentation and this process uh, in the face of what we're seeing um, with the pandemic. Uh, I'd really much prefer to have been spending this time supporting our staff and preparing NVRH and the community for this next phase of the pandemic that we uh, seem to be entering. And while I believe that we have prepared a prudent and reasonable budget, there are some things that I want to really specifically call out that, that you may not pick up or may or may not pick up as we walk through this. Um, firstly, it's a global observation. And that is that as a state and a system, we've done a very good job of controlling costs and delivering high quality care to the communities we serve over this past decade. And while the cost, the goal of cost cutting is both necessary and admirable, there are consequences. We, and I use the global we here, have created a healthcare system that has zero slack. There is no excess capacity. And even without the impact of the pandemic, our aging population has put increasing pressure on our system. We've got older and sicker patients who need a lot more care. Compounding that fact is the is the matter of our broken mental health system, which means that people are su who are suffering are waiting for days in our emergency departments for a bed to open up. And I can't stress this enough. Our own staff are stretched thin. Our heroes who are doing all this incredible work, our nurses, our LNAs, our techs, and our clinicians, they're exhausted. For the last several weeks, NVRH has been at or near capacity with very sick people. And this is without a surge in COVID. We're unable to transfer to tertiary care facilities because they are often full and we are finding ourselves in a position where we're transferring people farther and farther away. The open question I need to ask all of us is, we created this system, but is this what we want? From, for our mental health patients to language in our ERs, for critically ill patients cared for in hospitals three, four, hours away from home, or for our staff to be so burdened and burned out that they're choosing other lines of work. There's another issue that I want to raise, and I think it's hidden in our uh, budget presentation today, and that is around inflation. We have presented a budget that works really hard to maintain reasonable increases in costs over this next year. But my team and I do not believe that the inflationary risks to our economy are temporary or transitory. While we've presented a budget that tries hard to control these inflationary pressures, we are seeing impacts on everything from wage pressure to drug costs and supplies and facilities improvements. I believe that inflation will have a significant impact on future hospital budgets all across our state. We're committed to serving our community and we are here for our patients, but we need the Green Mountain Care Board's help and, the, and your support by approving this budget as presented. In our presentation, I hope you see what I see, which is an extremely well-run institution. Committed staff all making prudent and reasonable decisions to ensure that care needs of our community are met. We're serving our neighbors, friends, and our families. We cannot meet their needs without the support from the entire system. So thank you for indulging me in these opening remarks. I'm going to now turn it back over to Bob for the uh, formal presentation of the budget. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for those comments. Uh, we're going to move ahead to slide the next slide. Uh, as requested, uh, we have reproduced our income statement here as part of our presentation. And we'll start by looking at a bridge of our fiscal 21 budget uh, net patient revenue and fixed payment revenue to our fiscal 22 uh, net patient revenue and fixed payment revenue budgets. Our approved uh, net patient revenue for fiscal 21 was 90,525,000. Uh, we're budgeting that to grow 
to 97,368,000. And you can see some of the major variables here. Uh, we expect our volume to return to pre-COVID levels uh, to approximately 2019 levels in most of the areas and expand uh, beyond that in some. And as we talked about with the ED visits uh, to, to retract a bit from 2019 levels. Um, we're particularly seeing the return of patients to our medical practices, uh, those 14 medical practices I mentioned. Uh, patients are coming back and uh, at least to 2019 volume levels and in some cases because of the addition of some providers uh, beyond 2019 levels. Our 2021 budget did not sufficiently include COVID testing revenue. Um, we anticipate COVID testing to go on into fiscal 22, uh, probably given what's happening now at a greater level than even we've anticipated here in the budget. Uh, for example, now we're doing about 70 tests a day uh, for, on COVID patients. Um, Code Silver, EV parking lot. Code Silver, EV parking lot. Code Silver, EV parking lot. Maybe, Sean, you could just mute yourself and, until you speak. Yeah, sorry, I hesitated. A code silver is uh, somebody with a weapon outside of the parking lot. Um, based on information we've received from one care, we anticipate our Medicaid attribution to increase uh, in 2022. And we've also included the value-based incentive fund payment here. Uh, it's a little deviation from how we handle those uh, revenues internally, but we've been asked to include those as part of our net patient revenue figures. Uh, sequestration uh, is expected to come back in 20, in December of or January of 22, actually. Uh, sequestration to us is a, is a, a Medicaid sequestration is a hit of about 575,000 a year. As you know, that was waived for a period of time. Um, and the, uh, bringing that back will have an, uh, an impact of about $143,000 before it returns in January. That's a positive. Uh, uncompensated. I'm sorry, this is, excuse me, this is a court reporter. There's a lot of background noise, so. I'm sorry, hold on. And, and Bob, if you could speak up just a little bit, that would help. I sure can. And Thanks. I'm also repositioning the microphone and uh, have closed my door tightly. So is that it better? It is better, Bob. And if you guys need a few minutes to make sure everything's okay, we, we can go into recess if necessary. Um. Our, uh, team, our team is responding. Okay, thank you. Uh, I may walk down the hallway, but I'll be right back. Bob, you can continue. Okay. And hopefully I can, I'm heard better now. Does it Does it sound like I'm muffled? Uh, I want to make sure I, I'm talking through a headset, but I, I'm not sure it's coming through that or through my computer. So is there so, any muffling sound? So I'm hearing you fine, but okay. I'm I'm used to you too, Bob. So the better question is, Joanne, how are you hearing him? Uh, fine, but just please keep your voice up and that'll make it easier. Sure, Thank, well. you. Thank you. Yep. And again, don't hesitate to, to stop me. Uh, so I was talking about our change in uncompensated care, uh, which we're seeing a decline in. Um, and part of that we attribute to the increased Medicaid enrollment uh, numbers that one care has given us. Um, last year during the budget presentation, I talked about the cost of one drug that's only for a couple of patients. Uh, the cost of that drug has now increased to over $1 million a year, an increase of about $278,000 from last year. But we have uh, expanded several of our services, uh, pulmonary, pulmonology, I should say, ENT and, and pain management services. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, and the change from our rate increase, we're expecting to be about $1.2 million. And we estimate that for every $1 of rate increase, we receive about $401,000 of net patient revenue. The table down the bottom, I'm trying to illustrate that if you look at routine ongoing uh, revenue growth, it's about 3.3% of the growth, or about 2.9 million. Other factors, the volume returning to pre-COVID levels, uh, the expanded and new services, those other factors account for 4.3% of the total 7.6% increase in, in our um, net patient revenue. But again, the routine ongoing business 
would have yielded only about a 3.3% growth in our net patient revenue. Uh, next, please. The, uh, as I mentioned, we're requesting a 3% rate increase. Uh, on average, for the last five years, our rate increase is just a little bit under three and a quarter percent. We'll achieve that 3% average by increasing our hospital service fees by 3.4%. Uh, and as I've indicated here, we just had a uh, complete review done of our charge description master, and we've had our prices for most of our services compared to those of our peer group. Uh, so we'll be using that data to help us guide our price increase strategy, to help guide that 3.4% increase uh, for fiscal 22. And we will not be increasing our fees for provider services at all. Um, then on a budget to budget basis, again, the net patient revenue increase due to utilization is about 1.7%. I mentioned our provider practices, our medical practices have seen significant volume increase. Our operating room revenue and department continues to, to see to get busier. Our physical therapy department uh, is growing as well. Um, we while some practices are growing, we continue our efforts to reduce avoidable ED visits here, and you can see from Fiscal 2018 to so far in fiscal 21, we've gone from about 27% avoidable ED visits to about 17.5% ED visits, uh, avoidable ED visits. So significant decline there. And as Sean mentioned, our express care operations in partnership with Northern Counties Healthcare are playing a significant role in that, we believe. Uh, net inpatient revenue from uh, newer expanded services is about 1.6%. Uh, our E and T, your nose and throat practice, we shared with um, Littleton Regional two days a week. Um, that was just not meeting patient needs. The current wait time for patients seeking an ENT provider is two point, I'm sorry, two to three months. Um, and patients just aren't waiting, so they're going elsewhere specifically across the Connecticut River uh, to get that care instead of waiting. Uh, our pain management program we're going to expand as well. Um, the same issue a provider wait, somebody waiting for pain management uh, is waiting about three months for that care. Um, our pulmonology, pulmonology provider we had shared with uh, North Country Hospital. That provider left and we are uh, provide uh, uh, other referring providers have said we really need a full time pulmonologist. Uh, and so we are right now have employed the only pul pulmonologist in northern Vermont uh, and New Hampshire. Uh, and she is already very busy. Um, we, uh, as I said here, and I can expand a little bit, are, are seeing ourselves really becoming more and more of a regional provider. Um, we continue to see patients being referred from uh, north of us, up from North Country Hospital and from uh, Grafton County Hospital. Um, we see a lot of orthopedic cases coming from up north. Some of our growth in physical therapy has come from outside of our service area from up north. Uh, and to put it in per into perspective, uh, compared to the same period two years ago, our, our revenue from Orleans County is up 29% and our revenue from Grafton County is up 39%. Next slide, please. Here is our trended charge increase. As I said, that works out to an average of a, just under three and a quarter percent uh, annually for the last five years. Next. Um, Next are our payer assumptions. Uh, we do not anticipate any changes to our commercial payer discounts. Uh, we do not expect any changes to Medicare's uh, rules for critical access hospitals. Uh, we talked about the uh, sequestration uh, issue. Um, for in 2022, we will participate in all of the One Care value based programs except Medicare. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that shortly as well. 
I, I talked briefly about our lower uncompensated care trend. We're anticipating that will continue. Um, we did anticipate the potential negative economic impact of COVID and what that would do to our uncompensated care during 2021. Uh, that, that did not happen. Um, we are seeing this decline in uncompensated care, uh, despite the fact we have not changed our uncompensated care policies at all. Our patient assistance program, which is the, the free care program, uh, did not change. Uh, and for uh, patients that have balances that, that don't qualify uh, for our patient assistance, we are expanding the amount of time they can pay those bills um, beyond what we normally had done. So uh, there's no change in policies that have resulted in our decreased uncompensated care. And as I, I again mentioned, we think part of that is the increased Medicaid uh, enrollment. That which, by the way, we work hard with our employees to, to make sure that they might qualify for Medicaid and help them through the process to qualify for Medicaid. Um, next. Uh, our budget for 2022 does not include any provider transfers. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've expanded services, but there is no provider transfers included. Uh, nor were there any material accounting changes adopted in fiscal 21 and none are anticipated in fiscal 22. Uh, next, our uh, other operating and non-operating revenue. Uh, as you can see, there's two main components of our other operating revenue, that being the 340B program and the uh, referral of the reference lab revenue. Um, we do operate a vaccination clinic uh, that doesn't show up here as any revenue because it's a break even. It's a contract with the state in conjunction with our partners at Northern Counties Healthcare, and it just covers costs uh, per contract. So there's, there's zero operating revenue, but I do want to point out that we are operating the vaccination clinic. Um, our stimulus money uh, for 2021 projected, uh, we're still working through the final guidelines on how that money can be used. Um, we do anticipate that it is highly likely that the 1.1 million uh, will be greater for the 21 projected. In other words, we will be able to recapture and record more than 1.1 million as uh, other operating revenue from that stimulus grant money. Now, we don't have a final number yet and probably will not have a final number until close to uh, the final deadline of uh, September 30th. Um, NVOH uh, does not budget for non-operating revenue. Almost all of our non-operating revenue or expense is gains or losses, losses on our investments. And, uh, as you've heard me say before, we cannot predict that, so we do not budget any non-operating revenue. Moving to the next slide, our expenses. Um, our budgeted operating expenses for 2021 were $93,488,000. Um, a big change going from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22 is the provider tax increase. Um, as you know, the 2021 um, provider tax is based on based on our actual 2020. Um, so, Bob, if I could just interrupt you for a second, um, your screen went black for me. Oh, oh, it just came back on. OK. Did others have that same problem? OK. So we're on slide 14, Terry, if you could uh, back up to 14. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep, thanks for putting that out. Yeah. Um, our provider tax it, it was based on our then projected 2020 revenue and our volume came back much quicker than we anticipated and our, therefore our actual 2020 that patient revenue was much higher, resulting in a higher tax moving into 2022. Um, the new and expanded programs, uh, you can see we're budgeting about 1.3 million. We talked about those on the revenue side. Uh, this is the expense side of that. Um, if you were to compare those two, by the way, you'd see that we are expecting a 
slight operating margin from those new and expanded services. Uh, talked about the revenue side again of the COVID testing. We see the expenses of, of that as well. Uh, our operating room in particular, our uh, major op uh, orthopedic cases uh, continues to increase. Um, and we have uh, the, the cost of those implants, as you might know, is very expensive. And so as that volume grows, our associated costs are projected to grow as well. Um, the cost side of that one drug I mentioned uh, is 278,000. Um, we're anticipating uh, our travelers' expenses to decrease, and we'll see shortly. That is one of the risks uh, as we encounter, you know, as mentioned, Sean mentioned staff burnout. As there's pressures on uh, us to retain employees, um, one risk is that the reduction in travel expenses may not actually happen. Uh, we'll be recruiting some additional providers and other positions in 2022, so we're putting some money in the budget for that. Um, we gave our employees an increase in 21 earlier than anticipated, and that expense carries forward to next year. Um, we're starting to return to normal capital expenditures, so that will increase our depreciation expense. Again, we pretty much held all capital investments in 2020 after the uh, the COVID pandemic and, and our concerns about cash flow. We budgeted about a routine supplies, about a 2% um, inflation index, a little bit higher than 2%. Uh, you can see the anticipated cost of our salary increase, um, FTE increases. This is for FTEs not associated with new or expanded services, but you can see some of the categories of expenses that we've had to uh, to to carry into the budget. Uh, other volume related expenses uh, increases are about 320,000. And we're projecting to uh, find ways to reduce expenses by about 361,000. Uh, some of that is for our ongoing efforts to maximize the 340, 340B costs uh, in our supply, ch uh, supply chain savings through our group purchasing organization. Next. Here is the trend of our operating margin. Um, you can see we're fortunate to the last five years to have a positive operating margin. And in fact, if this um, trend were to go back 10 years, it would show that nine out of the last 10 years, we had a positive operating margin Pushing back five years beyond that, uh, we've had a positive operating margin 13 of the last 15 years. So we've uh, been pretty consistent uh, from year to year for the last several years. Uh, next, you can see our five year op average operating margin is 1.8%. Uh, uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this, but uh, we are preparing for a major. Uh, project expansion, a uh, West Wing emergency room project expansion. Um, based on current estimates, we think that cost will be about $22 million. Um, so we're needing to budget a minimum of 2% operating margin in 21, 22, and beyond in order to support the cost of that and the associated uh, debt that we'll be taking on to fund a part of that project. And uh, our total operating margin is just the operating margin plus or minus our gains on losses and investments. So we don't have a number of that. As requested, our balance sheet is reproduced here. Um, uh, just to complain to it. Again, increase from 107 to 143 days to support the West Wing project and ongoing debt coverage. Uh, we feel we're well positioned to take on new debt. Our balance sheet in terms of the capital structure ratios uh, indicates that we're well positioned to add that long-term debt. Our current debt to service coverage ratio is about 5.4 times, and our ratio of long-term debt to capitalization is about 0.1. So uh, based on those metrics, we're in good shape to take on some additional debt at school. 
slide moving to slide 19 uh, cash flow budget. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of things here. Um, we're anticipating putting about 3.1 million into the West Wing project during fiscal 22. The details will be coming on that in a few minutes. Um, and we're repaying about almost 11 million of the Medicare advance payment that we received last year. We've received 13 million in total. By the end of 2022, we'll have paid back 11 million of that. Um, so if you look down near the bottom of that page, it looks like a decrease in cash of about 12.8 million. But if you exclude the repayments of the Medicare and you exclude our 3.1 million investment in the West Wing project, we actually had a positive cash flow of about 1.1 million. And I'd also note that we're seeking short term funding options for that 3.1 million. So we may not have to burn as much of our own cash for that during 2022. But I don't have any commitments yet, so I've not put that into the budget, cash flow budget. And I am going to take a break and turn it over to others on the team. Um, we'll talk about some of the risks and opportunities and the first will be uh, Julie Schneckenberger, our Chief Nursing Officer. Julie? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'll just speak briefly to these uh, risks that we uh, feel could ne negatively affect our fiscal year. Um, the labor market is tight. I don't think that's news to anyone. Um, Vermont has over 1,200 postings for RNs and over 300 postings for LNAs. Um, currently, we have 33 open positions that include RNs, LPNs, and LNAs across, across all of our clinical areas. Right now, we have 11 requests out for travelers to fill some of these positions, and we're currently utilizing eight travelers working in all of our clinical areas. In addition to this, we have 25 um, other positions posted for a variety of jobs across our um, campus. Travel nurses are asking for and getting anywhere from $125 to $180 an hour, uh, depending on their specialty. Many of the travelers are not vaccinated. Um, the supply of travelers has severely dwindled over the last couple of years. Two years ago, we would get 10 applicants for one position. Now we have positions posted for weeks and have no applica applicants at all. Um, the new patient care tower that's going to be built at uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock, um, our understanding is they're increasing their beds by 60, 20 of which are designated ICU beds, and there's a, an estimate of 60 RNs plus ancillary personnel will be needed to staff this um, tower, and we believe that that is also going to put an additional strain on our recruitment efforts. Mandated vaccines, we feel, will also affect our ability to hire staff. Um, I had a call earlier today from a nurse working in Maine where they've mandated vaccine for all healthcare workers, looking for a position um, somewhere where vaccines are not mandated. Um, and she, I guess, is going to have to look a little further south. Um, that is basically what I have. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks, Julie. Uh, I'll talk. It's Bob again. I'll talk a little bit about our inflationary pressures. Sean alluded to them. The, the main one that I and others I think are most concerned about is our labor costs. The, the tightening labor market that Julie uh, mentioned is driving up uh, uh, the rates for not just travelers, uh, but, but staff at all levels of the organization. Um, our supply chain, we're doing a good job, we think, in, in maximizing savings from our purchasing contracts, um, but we're not sure that uh, we've got enough inflation built into the budget, uh, and, and that would it'd be a risk if we don't have enough. Uh, we talked about the project, um, the impact of the current inflation for equipment and construction. Um, do we have enough money to, is, it, is $22 million going to be enough for that project? Uh, our construction manager is estimating 10% per year growth in construction costs, so he's not sure that that is going to come down any. Uh, so that's some of our inflationary pressures, and, and Dr. Roos is going to talk a little bit about some of the other risks that we have in the 2022. 
Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit on the um, chronic strain um, on our mental health system and how it's impacting what we're able to do here at NVRH. Uh, there's a couple of slides coming up that I'll, I'll show you um, that talk about that. Um, you know, we're an acute care hospital, critical access hospital. We do not have any designated, true designated mental health um, uh, services, really. Um, you know, we have some counselors, um, but we've had to uh, contract with a telepsychiatrist in order to be able to be sure and round out our um, care that we can give to the patients because we end up having a fair number of patients in mental health crisis uh, with exacerbations of their chronic mental illness. Um, the other thing we're running into are true capacity issues, and I'm assuming the board is seeing this from the other hospitals as well. Um, a lot of our work here in caring for patients in the community involves triaging them, assessing them, stabilizing them, and then ultimately getting them to a tertiary care facility for the further care that they need. So if they have advanced cardiac problems or major uh, organ derangement, they're going to need a tertiary care bed. And there have not been adequate tertiary care beds available. Dartmouth is our main referral. Uh, tertiary care hospital has been full uh, in the 90 plus percent of the time when we go to transfer somebody. UVM has been our backup. They've been full much of the time um, when we go to transfer somebody. We recently um, had somebody quite acutely ill who needed a transfer, something we could not care for here, a variceal bleed, something we don't do. Uh, Dr. Sexton called 22 hospitals around New England and um, the Northeast, um, all full, all unable to accommodate. Finally found a bed in Albany, New York. Um, so um, we're transferring people uh, far afield, Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Maine Med in Portland, Maine, Mass General in the Brigham in Boston, and Catholic Med Medical Center in uh, Manchester, as well as Concord, uh, New Hampshire. Um, those are just some examples of where we're transferring people to get care, um, uh, a higher level of care. Um, the availability of mental health beds is um, causing long wait times in our hospital. Um, up to 45 hours at a time. This graphic shows that 40. Um, if you look at the um, angulated line, that is the number of hours. Uh, in 2019, it was averaging about 24, 25 hours. In 2020, it went to 32 hours. And so far in 2021, 45-hour wait time for uh, mental health boarding. Um, and uh, the Second graphic on the right-hand side of the screen, the um, orange color or, um, yeah, kind of a yellowish-orange is pediatric cases. An unfortunate consequence of uh, the pandemic is we're seeing a lot more pediatric emergency mental health, and you can see the cases um, have doubled in the last two years, um, more than doubled in the last two years. You know, other consequences of the mental health crisis is we have clinical patient um, safety observers one-on-one -on -one with mental health patients. This is a one-to-one -one paid 24-7 uh, physician that uh, amounted to um, $385,000 added to our budget in order to take care of these patients. Um, we were required to do that by CMS some years ago to be sure that these patients remain safe. We have to transport these patients. There's cost there. And another sort of uh, hidden cost is our licensed nursing assistants um, are often assigned to be the CPSO, clinical patient observer, and they have to leave their acute care assignment in order to do that. Um, so we have less care for our acute patients and less job satisfaction for these um, uh, nurses. Uh, licensed nursing assistants, um, and unfortunately, it's harder to maintain them. Um, they are moving on because they can 
um, they find a better work arrangement elsewhere. This uh, second slide, again, demonstrates mental health visits and the average boarding time. You can see it varies. We had a, a real influx around May. Um, and um, the slide to the right is um, actual patients. Um, you can see based on that, there are patients who come in repeatedly. Um, volume by age, the majority are adults, but you can see uh, nearly a quarter are pediatric. Um, in the further lower right-hand corner, you can see the difference between a voluntary um, and an involuntary. Um, fortunately, involuntary patients don't have to wait as long. An involuntary patient is um, a little easier to place. Voluntary patients staying for um, about 59.55 uh, hours. Involuntary patients can stay for as long as 96 hours, four days in an uh, emergency evaluation position. These are the most volatile, uh, volatile level one patients, um, and they've been um, somewhat difficult for us to handle. So we've had some real um, difficulties dealing with some of our mental health cases. Um, and as um, you may have heard, um, security um, for us here in the Northeast Kingdom has been a difficult issue. Our Caledonia Sheriff's, uh, Caledonia County Sheriff's uh, have not been able to staff and provide our coverage. So we're having to find alternative security arrangements as well. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a tough time on the inpatient side, and, um, but we um, are, are trying to make it through. Um, the other issue is post-acute care beds, the uh, nursing homes in our region. Um, I think in, like most places, uh, you know, it must have been very difficult to staff a skilled nursing facility during COVID um, with isolation beds and limited ability to transfer. Uh, we had to hang on to patients a little bit longer. We've uh, undergone uh, ownership changes in both of the skilled nursing facilities in our region. Um, they're having trouble with both nursing staff as well as medical directorship for both of these facilities. So um, struggling a bit at that end. Next slide. So again, continuing with the theme on um, risks, um, the COVID-19 resurgence because of the Delta variant is just, uh, I'm sure you've heard that in your hearings, but it's just disheartening. Um, we've been working hard to try to provide excellent care for all of these patients, uh, and now we find that it's, it's coming back. Um, despite the fact that we have a high vaccination rate. Um, and now we're facing schools returning. They, they likely will not be doing remote learning, um, fortunately, uh, but they will have a mask mandate. Um, but the, um, the risk of the Delta virus, uh, Delta variant um, affecting our employees is gonna affect staffing. When a child comes home sick, the parent has to stay home with them and then we're um, essentially out a staff person. Um, we're looking at supply chain disruption again and um, the availability of personal protective equipment. Um, we're having to re, because the pandemic's been going on so long, we're actually having to refit test everybody for what now is a different N95 mask. Um, so the logistics of uh, maintaining an acute care hospital through all this has been uh, quite burdensome. I will. Yeah. Why don't you continue to talk about the designated agency and then I'll come back. Okay. Um, well, most of you have probably heard that um, the Northeast Kingdom Human Services designated agency in our region um, had uh, was cited for a number of deficiencies and was on the verge of possibly not being able to continue with their contract. Um, they are undergoing a rejuvenation plan uh, to try to get back on their feet. Um, they've had to curtail some services um, and um, are barely meeting the, you know, the needs of the, 
um, mental health patients in our in our region, and that just adds um, to um, because where where do most of these patients end up is in our ED, and um, at times they end up on our inpatient service. So um, that's just another uh, risk for us. Um, I would say, fortunately, fingers crossed, um, we have not had a a, a lot of um, patients with mental health crisis were COVID positive because that presents another whole set of problems, but uh, we've been very lucky there. Thanks, Mike. So a couple other risks that uh, we'll talk about is uh, the 340B revenue program. Um, I'm sure you've heard about drug manufacturers pulling their drugs out of that program. Uh, the risk is that others will continue to do so and uh, we've got about 2.4 million budgeted in that 340B revenue. Uh, and uh, there's a risk because of additional withdrawals that that might uh, be uh, overstated. Um, I mentioned that we're going to expand our participation in the uh, One Care Value Based programs. We've budgeted $812,000 of risk. Um, that is not our maximum level. Um, and so if our actual risk uh, exceeds that, uh, actual risk liability, exceeds that as an additional risk to us achieving our 2022 budget. Moving to the next slide, um, some of the risks and opportunities. I'm going to turn it over now to Laura Newell to talk about uh, a few of these. And, uh, Laura? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for hearing us today. Um, the first bullet there, um, one of the Vermont did an excellent job of navigating this COVID pandemic and one of the unintended consequences, a good consequence, is that Vermont became a place to be. Um, people want to come to Vermont. Um, they see it as a safe place to be. Um, I think throughout the pandemic, people came back to their roots and valued their time with their family more and um, realized that Vermont is a great place to um, have a great work-life balance. Um, so we've, we've seen this happen with our provider recruitment. Um, normally we may get uh, a couple applications for our provider openings, but um, throughout the past year or so, um, we've had an influx of applicants for all of our provider uh, postings. So that's been really great. We're happy to see the high quality candidates that are coming through and that are moving to Vermont and staking this as their home. Uh, the second bullet, uh, we've entered a contract with Alpine Telepsychiatry, and we're super excited about this. Um, Alpine is providing uh, telepsychiatry services throughout our organization, so not only um, in the ED and emergent situations and in our inpatient situation, but also um, they're providing services to our medical practices. So this will really help with the continuity of care and supporting patients throughout their, their touches within our organization and um, the care continuum. Um, we'll continue to use telehealth services. Uh, we had kind of a, an abrupt start to telehealth last year when the pandemic hit. Um, it's proven to be a great resource for patients and providers alike, um, especially for our counseling providers. Uh, it's working very well. Um, as Bob mentioned earlier in the presentation, we will uh, we plan to budget for 10 telehealth visits per week in our primary care offices, and we'll utilize telehealth services as appropriate in other specialties. Bob, I think it's back to Thanks. you. Thanks, Laura, yeah. Um, so we will continue to use uh, the 340B program to reduce our outpatient costs. That uh, is an opportunity. Our pharmacy director uh, does an outstanding job of, of making sure that we're getting every possible drug under the 340B program and maximizing those savings. Um, I talked about the manufacturers pulling out of the 340B program. Uh, we're working uh, continue and we'll continue to work with our medical providers to find alternatives. So drug A uh, has been pulled by a manufacturer, but drug B is 
manufactured by somebody still in the program and has the same efficacy and uh, patient outcomes, the providers are often willing to switch to that drug that's still eligible for the 340B program. Uh, so we uh, are working uh, on that to minimize the lost 340B revenue. An opportunity, I mentioned the downside risk for the one care uh, value-based programs. There is also upside risk. We budgeted a downside risk of 812,000, but there's a potential for upside risk uh, as well to almost that same level. So that's an opportunity uh, as well. Uh, moving to the next slide, um, I'm going to turn it back to Laura to talk a little bit more. Yeah, um, the first bullet point there, I'm um, talking about the One Care Data Analytics. Um, we've had the opportunity to really leverage this information um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we use it to identify areas for improvement and um, take action to improve where we can. Um, we also use this information to ensure that no patient gets left behind that could benefit from care coordination in our um, connected system. Um, improving operational effic efficiencies through cross-departmental collaboration. Um, I, we do a really great job of this at NVRH. Um, we utilize work groups when opportunities are brought, brought forth. Um, recently, a group of employees started something called the collaboration tank. Uh, this is a group of employees that will that gather together to vet projects, ensure that all the stakeholders are at the table um, from the inception of the project and get projects from start to finish efficiently. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, we're also focusing on introducing new patient-centered technology um, and, and integrating it across our, our healthcare system. Um, things like continuous glucose monitors, um, as probably many of us have our Apple Watches on today, um, that provides a lot of health information that can be beneficial to our care. So looking at how we can integrate those into our healthcare delivery system. Thank you. Hi, Julie, did you, yeah. I'm just going to talk a little bit about our nursing education program um, that we continue to expand and develop. Um, we've got a nursing um, RN nurse educator on every nursing unit now. They all work collaborative, collaboratively together to provide education um, across the units um, and they uh, provide education for nurses, LPNs, LNAs, um, and they this education keeps them, uh, the, the staff up to date on their skills and current practices that are out there. Um, we offer mental health de-escalation training and restraint training in the event we need to apply restraints, review equipment that they use, medication administration, um, keeping all providers and uh, staff that are needed to ha um, have ACLS, DLS, and PALS. That's all done through the hospital. Um, and we have a great simulation lab that we share um, with the VTC nursing students that come here to use um, our facility for clinical practice. Um, the staff have found this um, increase in free education, uh, great. They don't have to travel, keeps them up to date, helps them with their certifications. Um, they, they find this to be a good retention um, uh, a retention product, I'll call it. Um, and then we also started an LNA program not too long ago, and we've put quite a few um, people through that program. Some of our staff that worked in the Environmental Services Department uh, took this program, passed, and are now working as LNAs. Um, and then we also uh, extended to our home health and hospice um, neighbors, and they have a few uh, personal care attendants that are now LNAs and uh, are now able to uh, provide a increased level of care for the patients that they're um, looking after. Thanks, Julie. Next uh, slide, please. Um, 
So value based participation for 2022. Um, the slide says Medicaid will to be determined. We have determined that we will not participate uh, in the Medicaid program, Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid program, but will participate in all the others. Um, the budget at risk again, you can see is 812,000. And our monthly budgeted uh, fixed payment, uh, fixed, fixed prospective payment is 752,000. Um, total attributed lives uh, we're budgeting for is 12,400 uh, per month for 2022. And uh, I, I highlighted here that the Medicare downside risk is just too high for a critical access hospital. If we were to include the Medicare, the risk, uh, risk annually would increase to about two and a half million dollars a year. Again, much too much for this or I, my opinion, any critical access hospital. Next, our capital investment plans. Um, so we have about 2.6 million of routine capital budgeted. Um, the larger ED West Wing project, um, we're hoping to fast track a portion of that uh, and we'll be in touch with the CON office shortly to, to discuss this. Um, we uh, need to uh, expand our capability to handle patients with mental health conditions. Uh, part of the bigger project is a dedicated mental health support waiting area. Uh, we'd like to fast track that and start that ahead of the main project. So our budget includes $2.8 million for that uh, phase of what we call phase A of the West Wing ER expansion project. We've also included money for the CON preparation, about $300,000 of the phase B or the rest of that project. Um, the actual CON for the entire project, we will be filing this fall. Um, in 2021 dollars, as you can see, it's a, a little bit over 19 million. Our target, again, based on 10% inflation a year, targeted project cost is 22 million dollars when we anticipate starting construction in 2023. One other, if you look out over our five year, four year capital spend plan, another major uh, cost will be upgrading our Meditech system. Uh, we'll put budget uh, budget 2.5 million uh, for that. I just note here that we also have a, a committee, a capital budget committee uh, that reviews our capital plan monthly. Plans change, priorities change uh, during the year, and this committee helps us readjust as necessary throughout the year our capital budget uh, planning process. Next. The impact on COVID, um, I think Laura or Mike, you can start talking uh, about the impact. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, how have we fared with COVID-19? Um, well, you know, what a what a 18 months it has been, I can tell you. Um, it's gone by, well, like a whirlwind. Um, we thought we were winding down in June. We had very few cases. We actually went some weeks without cases and... Uh, we stopped having to do monoclonal antibody infusions and no inpatients, and we really thought we were on the home stretch. And then, uh, and then the uh, fourth wave came through, and uh, we're back in business again as far as dealing with COVID. Um, but I think the impressive thing about NVRH is how we've handled it. Um, we have um, shown that we can stand up programs quickly and efficiently. Um, we converted our um, day surgery unit into a respiratory intensive care unit in a matter of a couple of days. We took care of a few patients down there and then gradually got our upstairs, second floor med surge and ICU um, ramped up to be able to take care of uh, COVID patients in a negative pressure environment. We put in um, four new negative pressure rooms on the med surge area and we converted our four ICU beds to negative pressure. We made the donning and doffing areas for all these so, and um, ramped up in um, really efficiently being able to get in and out of uh, PAPR hoods and PPE very quickly and efficiently. We uh, were really proud of that. It was 
um, homemade videos of how to do it, um, people using their uh, smartphones and downloading them onto our system, and uh, people were really studying them. It was really um, impressive to watch. We were one of the first uh, hospitals in Vermont to fully adopt monoclonal antibody infusions. We were fortunate. We had um, a vacant office suite that we were able to add negative pressure to and began doing monoclonal antibody infusions um, within weeks of it be getting emergency use authorization. Um, and um, that was in the in light of um, actually Dr. Levine not fully endorsing it, but we um, we felt that it made good sense and it's since become adopted as a standard of care. We've given over 100 infusions and we really think it's made an impact in the uh, number of hospitalizations of COVID positive patients in our region and probably a real impact on mortality uh, of those 100 patients um, if you went by the statistics, you know, 10% uh, of them probably would have died. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we continue to give, uh, right now it's Regeneron infusions, now with an added indication of post-exposure prophylaxis. So we're, we're ramping that back up um, because we expect we're going to have patients that get exposed and are going to want to get the infusion. We, of course, have become experts at remote meetings. And um, as expert as you can, um, we still forget to hit the unmute button occasionally, but um, we actually have improved attendance at some of our med staff meetings because people don't have to drive. We remember we're in the Northeast Kingdom. We have uh, um, health centers far afield, Danville, Concord, um, as well as all around St. Johnsbury and Lindenville. So um, providers are able to tune in and get back to work pretty quickly. So uh, remote meetings are probably going to be here to stay. Um, we've actually invested in some uh, state-of-the-art equipment to make them a little more efficient um, and a little easier to attend. Um, telehealth visits are very likely here to stay. There are, of course, our elderly patients where travel is difficult and uh, we do get bad weather and uh, we can still check in with patients remotely. So um, some of these things are actually um, going to continue. Um, we have looked into having uh, employees work remotely, which gives the added benefit of increasing office space here. We um, will likely be able to shuffle around and more maximally use some of our square footage here um, and improve the space. So we're looking into that um, in a meaningful way. Um, our maintenance crew have become experts on negative pressure. It's really impressive to see. They've installed meters and uh, fans, and um, we really have, um, I think, gotten quite good at that. Um, as you can imagine, it's been hard to get equipment and get contractors in during the pandemic. And uh, fortunately, we have a top-notch uh, maintenance crew that's been able to do a lot of the work on their own. So that's another amazing benefit. And you know, the ingenuity here in the Northeast Kingdom is, is truly amazing. Um, so we have um, focused on staff well-being. This is, I think it's been mentioned, been very difficult on staff. And um, we're very, very committed to focus on staff well-being. We have um, a Luminos well-being program for um, all of our uh, providers twice monthly. Uh, we get regular emails, we get check-ins, and we've expanded to the nursing staff as well. Um, and uh, we're very hopeful that everybody's going to hold up okay through all this. The other really um, amazing thing is we've stood up this um, really not very pretty building, but um, uh, a fairly large building that is our drive-through COVID operations center. Um, and uh, I think we thought it was going to be a temporary building, and we're going to be able to use some of that um, space for uh, maintenance-type um, activities. But um, we since have uh, purchased the trailer, and uh, it looks like it's going to be around for a while, I think, for a few more years, in fact. Um, so we have now a fully-blown COVID operations center where we do testing a few days a week. We give COVID vaccinations 
a few days a week. And it seems likely we're going to be doing flu and COVID boosters a few days a week uh, through there. And we've uh, really optimized that space. So a lot of great innovation, a lot of, um, you know, uh, really heartwarming to watch. Um, people working hard, doing a great job. Um, but we're, you know, um, really disappointed that we have to go through this again. So um, we are running at capacity. Um, we're having to delay transfers. We're having to take care of patients longer than we would like to here at our facility. Um, uh, we're having staffing issues. Um, we really are, um, we're working very hard to keep this place, um, you know, running smoothly, but uh, it, it can be um, very disheartening to um, find that we're having to cut back. Um, we can't provide as thorough a care as we might like. Um, um, we're um, having to turn some patients. We've had to um, limit the number of patients we could admit to our hospital because of staffing issues. We've had to close our um, emergency room to ambulances because of uh, capacity issues. Um, you know, uh, we've had um, staff hurt because of out-of-control mental health patients who are in crisis. Um, so um, it's a tough time. Um, and you know, add to all that uh, COVID protocols and uh, um, provider burnout. Um, and then uh, now we're in the midst of trying to decide how we're going to deal with um, uh, unvaccinated healthcare workers and other staffing issues like that. So um, I think in closing, I mean, we're, this, is, this is a tough time to be doing healthcare, as you probably heard. Um, but we need the resources to be able to provide our mission and keep going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that concludes our formal presentation. So thank you so much. Turn it over to the board and staff for questions. Thank you, Bob and, and everyone. Um, we're going to start uh, the board's questions with board member Holmes, Jessica. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation and thank you for all the hard work. I share your disappointment in where we are today. Um, the pandemic has obviously had a profound effect on our healthcare workforce. And I really just want to say, I'll say this to you and I'll say this to all the hospitals. I really appreciate your staff's efforts and continued efforts as we battle this virus. And I, I do wonder how much more we can take. Um, so I appreciate your presentation uh, and where you are. Um, you know, we've been, I've been trying to assess from all of the hospitals so far, uh, updates to where you're thinking the 2021 projections are going to be. And I know, Bob, you mentioned you don't know what the updated stimulus money is actually going to be, and it's hard to make those projections. But I'm wondering, you know, to some degree, have you been able to make any projections given the return to volumes, what you're thinking 2021 might end up like, and any your best estimate about what the stimulus money might be? Yep, so I think our 2021 projections are still solid, uh, other than that stimulus money, uh, Jessica. The, um, okay, but so you, in, in the 2021 estimates that you submitted in July, the 92 mm -hmm. million, yep. you, you anticipated the, the volume that you're seeing now in June, July, August, September? Um, uh, yes, this time of year we did anticipate most of those volumes to return, yes. Yep. Okay. Not all. Most other hospitals did not seem to do that, so it seemed yeah. like they were all increasing their projections based on what they're seeing now. So maybe just to clarify, so the projections that we just did, you know, in, in July, uh, seem to be holding. The original okay. budget, I think we maybe underestimated what the volume would be in 2021, but the projections we just completed, if okay. we submitted the budget, I think are accurate. Just so to, accurate. To okay. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and the stimulus money, um, all I can tell you is that everything I see right now says that we will be able to record more and not less of the stimulus money in 2021. Um, the amount is still uncertain, but uh, um, I, I would not be surprised if it was at least another million dollars. Okay, thank you. That's just helpful. Um, on the bridge table, 
if you could just clarify for me the bridge table, it's I think slide eight on your presentation, taking uh, fiscal year 21 budget to fiscal year 22 budget. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, I'm trying to understand the uncompensated care change, the $1 million, that's a shift from uncompensated care to Medicaid enrollment. And then also there's another line item above that in the change in FPP, which also is related to increased Medicaid attribution. So can you just explain to me a little bit that that's not several, you know, that that's not counting the same people moving from uncompensated care into Medicaid and therefore being attributed <laughs> to Medicaid, uh, getting a more fixed payment from them? So, sure. So we're seeing that the Medicaid fixed prospective payments will be increasing because there's more people enrolled in the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, our uncompensated care is going down. So our deduction from revenue for uncompensated care is going down as well. Okay. And it's not being somehow double counted in there. It's list. not double counted. No. Okay. no. So the uncompensated care write-offs are decreasing. Uh, and okay. we're seeing a shift to the, again, the Medicaid. Okay. And then actually what's interesting to me as I was thinking about it, as I was thinking about the shift from uncompensated care to Medicaid enrollment with the new increases in the QHP subsidies and the new, you know, more outreach um, at the federal government level about, you know, uh, opportunities for folks to enroll in healthcare under the Affordable Care Act, health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. Are you expecting any of this uncompensated care movement to also shift into commercial as more people gain access to health insurance because of the subsidies. Yeah, I did not anticipate that in the budget. So, you know, okay. It's possible, but uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Not, not predictable enough. Got it, okay. Um, one of my colleagues might also ask you about this, but I just was curious, you didn't fill in the HCA's table breaking down the commercial to Medicare reimbursement ratio by payer. May I ask why? So those two pieces, right? They wanted it broken down between inpatient and outpatient, and then by payer. It just um, the way our systems can report out, it, it just lumps all of that together as as one payer. Um, they could break out major payers, maybe Blue Cross from the others, but uh, several others are just bunched together. And uh, at the time, I couldn't pull okay, all that. Okay, I don't have the most updated way. version of this, but I I don't even have it by Medicaid and commercial lumped together. So I might not have the right table in front of me, but I, I don't have any. I have the, the whole completely the table empty. So perhaps I don't have the right version of this. Um, Do others okay. have it on the board? And I well, should just maybe I maybe I just didn't fill it up correctly. Okay. Would it be possible for you to fill that out? Uh, so so we could fill it out between in total, but not between inpatient and outpatient. OK. And as I said, uh, I think you should have it in the response. We are able to calculate that on average, our commercial pays about 160% of Medicare, which okay. No, that's, that's, that's helpful. Thank you very, very much. Sure. Um, I, and I also just wanted to note that I really appreciated the effort that Northeastern has made to reduce the avoidable ED visits. I know that was something that had come up in prior board meetings and um, you know, we did hear a presentation last week about these potential, potentially avoidable utilizations across the state, and it was just really refreshing to see that you are trying, working hard in this area, and actually calculating that metric yourselves and seeing the progression there. So I just wanted to kind of give you a shout out and say thank you. Really appreciate that, and uh, I hope that you'll continue to track that metric, especially as we're moving to value-based, you know, payment and trying to improve population health and get people you know, into care in a timely and appropriate setting so they don't end up in an inpatient setting or in an ED when they couldn't, you know, perhaps we could have avoided that. So I just thank you for that. Appreciate it. And I hope you'll continue to track that. Thanks for mentioning thank that. And we have made a note to include that in next year's presentation as well. That's right. Thank you for the shout out. Um, you know, it's it's we're really proud of how that's gone and we're excited to see the results. And I think what we're finding is that our patients really like the option. So it's a win-win. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I'm just going to telegraph that I would like to see all hospitals start to track that. And there might be some lessons that maybe you could share with other hospitals going forward about how you calculated that, you know, in your in your EMRs or in your you know data records. Um, also appreciate your focus on the issues related to the strains in mental health capacity in the state. 
the data that you're sharing is really troubling. It's, you know, I've been on the board for several years now. I, this seems to be an issue that will not go away. It's only exacerbated. I think that the pandemic has exacerbated it in so many ways, right? Whether it's the, you know, the increased acuity of our mental health patients, whether it's the shortages, whether it's now we're reaching capacity because of pent up demand. I mean, this is really going to be a, 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 we're in a crisis mode, I think. And I'm just wondering, you know, there's some light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps in some small ways um, with respect to, I know UVM Health Network is, you know, considering expanding inpatient capacity, but that's going to be several years off. There's, you know, work to be done on that front. Do you have any thoughts around short run solutions or short run mitigation strategies for this crisis that we're in? Is there anything that the board can do? <laughs> I would say, and is there anything the legislature can do? Um, what can be done that you all think about? My, uh, you know, my thoughts on this, it's a wicked problem and it's not a problem that developed overnight and it's going to be a problem that's going to be with us for years as we work through it. I know there are a lot of people working on these issues. I, you know, I, I, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we've really got to uh, make the investments here. You're seeing that in this build out of behavioral health or mental health uh, space in our ER. We really need that. What we have today is, is absolutely unsafe and it's really not good patient care. So we really, from the board's perspective, what we want is your support so that we can build out the facility so that we can care for these patients when they are here. Longer term, you know, part of the problem of the state is not only the facilities, but it's the workforce. And, you know, even though we're making investments in building out um, facilities, for example, what UVM is doing, I, I remain concerned long term about our workforce challenges. I don't have a good answer there. Um, part of it is reimbursement. Uh, you know, you look at the costs that we have trying to just uh, support these patients when they're here and, and you know, the, the reimbursement is there to cover the costs. And that's part of the compounding problem for us as we deal with the issue. When you say reimbursement, reimbursement by who? Medicaid in particular? Medicare? Yeah, yeah. Medicaid. Yeah. Medicaid. Largely Medicaid reimbursements. Yeah. Well, we're getting the numbers, Bob. Do you have any insight in that? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear. I, yeah, I, I don't think uh, I didn't hear, but I think what you're asking is, you know, the costs associated with that were you know, the, the uh, clinical patient safety observers. I think uh, Dr. Roos pointed out is close to four hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, that that's built into our ED visits. We don't get paid more for those ED patients to cover that four hundred thousand um, dollars additional cost. Yeah, I know um, that's the. Uh, has been looking into this. We get paid for an ER visit and the patient stays for 45 hours. You know, uh, you can't make money doing that. Um, you know, Vaz is looking to get the state to provide an additional payment for some of these patients, mental health patients that are boarding in our EDs. Um, and then the workforce issues, we still have about 30% of our mental health inpatient psychiatry beds that aren't open because they can't staff them. So there, there are capacity issues because of staffing. And they're just going to have to raise salaries and they're going to have to make those jobs more attractive. Um, there isn't any other way around it. I don't, you, you can't staff a position that nobody wants to work in. Yeah. Is there anything that could be done in the pipeline prior to an acute episode? that ends up in, a, in an ER or a in the hospital? I mean, what can we be doing at the community level to prevent some of these acute episodes that we don't have capacity to handle? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, that is actually something that we're working really closely with uh, Northeast Kingdom Human Services on is um, catching those um, as soon as possible when things start to escalate for a patient, um, meeting them um, at the primary care offices and uh, bringing in Northeast Kingdom Human Services as soon as possible so that we can prevent the ED visits and the inpatient stays. Yeah. And, and I had to tell it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think adding a telepsychiatry program too available in our practices could help that effort uh, yeah. earlier in the community. Well, that's all I have. I applaud those efforts and I hope that we can, you know, move the needle on this because it worries me. 
but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we'll go to board member Lunch, Robin. Thank you, and I just wanted to echo Jess's thanks about including the data on the ED utilization, because that is really encouraging and a real success story. So again, thanks. Um, I had a, I had a couple questions around um, the util utilization data that you had mentioned um, for um, services, folks coming down from the North Country service area or from Grafton. Um, and Bob, I think you said that over two years, you'd seen a 29% increase from Orleans County, and I think this was in revenue, and 39% from Grafton. And was that just for the four um, services that you were mentioning, ENT, audiology, pulmonary, and pain management, or was that overall? That, that's overall, Robin, yeah. Okay. We, we don't have it by service yet, but we're, we're working to capture that. Oh, great. Um, and do you have any sense, and again, this may be data that's not available yet, um, how that translates into like episodes or number of visits, things like that? Uh, nope, not yet. Okay. That's, uh, All right. Yeah, that's, I was asking because our data team had done um, some work on patient migration mm -hmm. um, and um, which was helpful in term for us in terms of being able to get a sense of that in and out migration. And certainly that's been an issue in your budget for a few years. So I'm just looking to see kind of forward looking how we might be able to crosswalk the data that you have with the data that we have and, and understand how they fit together. So yeah. thank you. Is that, that's a features data that you're? Um, it is actually VUDS, so it's a little bit that's, old. Okay. There's. Uh, I think some of it's VCURES and some of it's VUDS, but the patient um, migration, this one, the one that would correlate to what you were talking about was VUDS data. Okay. Um, yeah, and that is on we, our, our so website. What, okay. Yeah, once we can drill down a little bit deeper into the, those numbers, we can maybe do some better analysis. And cool. really share, share what we have in more detail. That would be great. Thank you. Um, Hold on just one second. And I think I think Jess asked all the other questions that I had on my list. So I'm good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Is it me, Kevin? Kevin, you're on mute. And I answered your question and everything, Tom. I, I introduced you and answered your question, and I was on Thank mute. Thank you. <laughs> well, move it along to Maureen then, you know. <laughs> so, Go ahead. Um, you know, the, the, the farther down the line you are, the easier it gets because, you know, the people before you um, ask a lot of questions, that, and they ask them better than, than I would. But I have a, a couple here. I'm... One, I'm I'm just interested in in your value based participation. I noticed, and I know it's an un unrealistic objective, but in your narrative, you were saying that that the tipping point in terms of value based uh, um, um, programs, you know, hitting the critical mass where the benefits of the value based programs was in the 50 to 60 percent range. Um, and I'm looking, you know, at where you are now. And you're at um, a little over nine percent participation in terms of um, <clears throat> um, uh, NPR FFP, and uh, um, so I'm I'm kind of looking at that as at a point in time, and also thinking about rate review that we just went through, where um, we were talking to the carriers about you know their participation, and um, Blue Cross Blue Shield was. Uh, you know, they, they were very open about it, that they said they would uh, kind of jump in deeper if they had some willing willing participant, will, willing partners, um, you know, referencing hospitals. And so I'm just, uh, I'm just, I, I, I want to kind of understand that, uh, that, that, that tension or that conflict a little bit better, um, that as you kind of work with OneCare and work with Blue Cross Blue Shield, 
uh, setting up programs. Do you, how do you foresee those, see, see that evolving at a pace um, that, uh, that, that the benefits of value-based programs in terms of efficiencies and economies and, and innovations um, get realized? Um, what, what is your kind of two or three year outlook in terms of, of uh, your hospital participating in value-based programs? Sure. Uh, we are participating or will be in 2022 in all of the value-based programs except Medicare. Uh, and, and the issue there is the level of risk that we would have to take on. Um, I, I would point out that we're participating in all the programs, but it's only Medicaid that has fixed payment, uh, prospective payment revenue. Right. So we'll be participating in the other programs, but that other the revenue for those other programs do not appear as fixed prospective payments. So that's only one piece of the value-based, total value-based revenue that we'll be uh, realizing in 2022. Um, so, uh, we're, uh, I mean, this, this, this is just a wild question, I guess, but where do you think you'll be in 2024? Um, and in terms of of particip participating in, I understand value-based programs and the risk quarter type programs. Um, Will you be much, much farther down the road than you are now? I, I would say the only program left that is currently uh, available is is Medicare. And yeah, I, I don't anticipate if the risk level is the same in 2024. I don't anticipating us participating in that either at that time yeah. either. Sean, I'm sorry. Did you say something? Yeah, I, I think that's a really difficult question to answer. I think as more programs become available, we have to evaluate each program on a case by case basis and determine whether or not it makes sense for us from a fiscal perspective and from a patient care perspective. Um, you know, we've been committed to the journey. Um, I think our, our budget this year demonstrates that we continue to expand um, into the programs that make sense. We're in every program except for Medicare. And, uh, you, you know, I anticipate that we will continue to, um, to continue down that path as the programs mature and expand. Um, but like Bob said, that risk corridor for a small critical access, access hospital is really challenging. And uh, we cannot put the fiscal health of our institution um, in jeopardy uh, simply to uh, be able to say we're participating in these programs. Is that oh, a I, reasonable I answer? Get, I get. I, I, I get that. I, I'm. I'm more interested in trying to uh, pull Blue Cross Blue Shield and the and, and the carriers uh, in, in, into the mix a little bit more than they have been, and they they readily admit that they're. An incredibly small piece of the pie, and uh, and that they want to do more, but they kind of point the finger at hospitals, saying that they, that they can't find willing, and that's their words, willing, willing, willing partners. So, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah. okay. so my next question was just a why. Um, I was, you know, listening to you talk about people coming to out of their eight um, uh, health service areas to into yours for physical therapy, for example. And so, I mean, so that's there and you're, and you're garnering some revenue from that. But why is that? Why are people traveling so far for physical therapy? Uh, well, of course, we offer a great service. <laughs> so, um, which in addition to that, um, we're hearing that, especially from the North, um, they're having trouble retaining physical therapists and there aren't any available. Uh, in some of those service areas. Uh, so they're coming here and liking what they see from our physical therapy uh, providers. Uh, I'd also add that we're getting major orthopedic referrals from north of us as well, outside of our service area. So those patients come, uh, get major orthopedic uh, sur surgery, and then come for our physical therapy services afterwards as well. Uh, so that's part of the physical therapy piece. I'd also add that in terms of pain management, a North Country Hospital gave up their pain management program, so that's why we're getting referrals for that service. Um, to my knowledge, they do not have a neurology. My knowledge, they don't have a neurologist and don't plan to have a neurologist. So our neurology practice is boom bursting at the seams from our own service area as well as trying to accommodate patients from outside of our service area. Tom, often what you see, and I think what we're experiencing is 
uh, neurology is a good example. Uh, I, I believe Littleton Regional recently abruptly lost their neurologist. Um, really tough to recruit th for, for neurology. You know, that's a tough service to bring to a rural area. So when that neurologist um, leaves the area, um, people get referred to the next closest. And, and we happen to be the beneficiary of that. And so with a lot of staff turnover and special, especially turnovers, there's a lot of that going on out there than the marketplace. People just kind of going, going to where the, the service is provided, even yeah. if it's a long drive, is what you're saying. Yeah. And pulmonology is another example of that. So. Yeah. And my, so my last question is uh, in terms of the um, uh, COVID advance money in Appendix 7, uh, you had a profile that there was $4.45 million of CARES Act money, uh, and, it, and it's kind of recorded as a liability now in both 2021 and 2022, but I'm quoting here, but what um, recently published financial final guidelines um, allows. So you you think that you're gonna be able to convert that to revenue? Yes, some, some of that we anticipate converting to revenue. That's the piece we're still trying to determine yep. uh, and, and don't have the final do you, answer. Do you, have, do you have a guesstimate about what some of that means? Um, I estimate it'll be at least another million dollars. At least could, what? At least another million dollars of money okay. we can keep, but we're still that's, that, going through that's, that. that so. That's real money. Yep. Um, that's, on, that's on next, after this process is completed, that's our next priority. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Next, we're going to turn to board member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, thanks, and thank you for the presentation and all the work you've been doing. Um, just to follow up on Tom's last question, um, why do you think you wouldn't be able to recoup the rest of that if you're only going to get a million dollars there? So we have to find COVID-related expenses, in other words, expenses related to the prevention or detection of COVID uh, and lost revenue because of the pandemic. So we have to find expenses and lost revenue that meet the criteria, and we may not be able to find enough to meet the entire 6.2 million that we received from that stimulus money. Okay, hopefully you can find it. <laughs> well, believe me, we're working. We're working on it. And, and Bob, we have, it was uh, what was the date certain that we uh, could find qualifying expenses? It was the 30th, right? June 30th. June so 30th. the period just ended, right? June 30th. Um, and the guidelines, well, the final guidelines came out June 30th, but I understand there were more changes yesterday to those guidelines. Um, and, and that's one of our other challenges is, I believe, since the first guidelines were printed on how we could use these funds, the guidelines have changed at least 15 times. So that's our, our other struggle is the ever-changing guidelines on, uh, that we're using to, to quantify what we can keep. Okay. And... Um on your ACO risk accrual, I think you have 812,000 left. Um, are you expecting any money back from any of the programs that you're currently in? Uh, One Care is telling us we'll get money back for the 2020, um, but the, there's not a, an amount certain yet, and there's not a date certain yet as to when we'll see that money. And as, if you get that money, will that um, change how much you put into an accrual or? Uh, if we get that money, uh, my plan is to put it into a reserve for 2021. We don't know how we're doing in 2021. I've put into our projection a $300,000 risk, um, but it could be much higher than that. So I will take any of that money we receive for 2020 and reserve it in case the 2021 estimate is, is understated. Okay. And then um, you've talked a little bit about some of the ER volume being down and, and having some express care in the community potentially. Um, so do you see that that may, you know, that people are going to other places, whether it's express care or primary care, and that maybe that will continue? We do, yeah. So part of the decline in ED volume this year, 2021, was especially early on attributed to patients hesitant to come back into the hospital for care. Um, we've seen that uh, mitigated somewhat and seeing patients coming back to the ED. Uh, unfortunately, in a number of cases, they waited too long, so their conditions worsened. Um, but we are seeing patients coming back to the ED. 
um, where appropriate. Okay. And we're seeing, as we've said, uh, we those express cures are up and running. Just to, to make sure everybody's aware of that, and we are seeing those volumes increasing uh, consistently. Every month, we're seeing higher patient visitations to the express care locations. So, so we expect that to continue as it becomes more popular. Great. And the other factor um, is we see uh, a lot of outdoor activities that draws a lot of people from Canada. Um, and some of them get injured and uh, yeah. the course of borders have been closed. So we're anticipating that that will return next year as well. Uh, and then can you talk about cost saving programs and any initiatives that you're working on now and how they're going to impact 2022 and beyond? Mm -hmm. So there's a few the maximizing the 340B savings for our outpatient drugs, uh, something we continue to do and do a great job at uh, due to our, our primarily our director of pharmacy's efforts. We continue to maximize our supply chain savings, uh, converting to our primary vendor uh, under the group purchasing organization uh, is, is one. We continue to work with our orthopedic surgeons on standardizing implants wherever we can um, so that we can maximize savings opportunities and bulk volume. Get the more volume we get from one vendor, the, the lower the price. Uh, and part of uh, what we talked about uh, specifically, uh, Laura Newell, was our cross departmental collaboration efforts to look at ways we can be, do things more efficiently throughout the organization. Um, so that's our fourth effort to, to find some okay. cost savings. And then um, just as a, a benchmark, um, I've been, you know, calculating based on your gross to net. Um, you know, what the in total, because we didn't have all the details of the inpatient, outpatient, you know, where each of the hand, hospitals stand relative to Medicare. And of the five hospitals now that we've done, um, you guys come in as, as the lowest. So, on my calculation, the way I'm doing it, which is consistent with everybody, it's 1.4. So, it's a little bit lower than what you were saying on the 1.6, but. Mm -hmm. Um, even on the 1.6, that would put you in relative to Brattleboro, it was at 1.5. So, I mean, it, it's good <laughs> from a benchmark. Um, you know, and I just want to compliment you on your, you know, I think, um, you know, your balance sheet looks strong. Um, you're ending with quite a bit of cash. And, um, you know, it's one of the, I guess, positives of COVID, if there is one, right, that, you know, maybe these um, plans from the feds and state work to help help keep things afloat, so. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Next, we're going to turn to the healthcare advocate. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, yes, thank you. we can. Okay, good. Good afternoon. My name is Kylie Kuiper, and I'm here on behalf of the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for responding to our pre-hearing questions. We got your responses in writing this morning. So I just have a few quick follow-up questions. Uh, my first one is um, that you specifically mentioned your ability to provide um, materials to patients in Spanish, and I was wondering how you assessed that that was the appropriate language um, to offer to your health service area. Hi, this is Diana Gibbs. I'll, I'll help respond to that. Um, so in our service area specifically, um, you know, our diversity is mostly in the way of socioeconomic status. So there is not a significant need for language translation um, services or other languages, um, but specifically, not that we chose um, or, or identified Spanish as the other language, um, our up-to-date subscription provides um, patient materials in that translated language um, already. So certainly not something we sought out or, or was informed. It's just available through the product. Um, there are other translation services that we could seek if we needed to, but I think it's worth noting that um, according to the demographics in our region, um, as far as the Hispanic population, we're looking at about 1.6%. So Spanish would be an appropriate second language choice. Um, and then the other thing just to mention is that based on our most recent community health needs assessment, um, English only being the language spoken at home is roughly 95% um, of the households that we're serving. 
And then the other question that uh, is represented in there are all other languages or all others who speak English less than very well, and that percentage is only about 1.1%. So the need is very low for language. It's more plain language and helping with the understanding of, of whatever um, information is trying to be provided. Okay, thank you. So my second question um, is that, so you noted that your bad debt and free care have recently declined in comparison to your overall gross patient revenue, care revenue. Um, this is a dynamic that we're seeing across a number of hospitals, and it's a bit counterintuitive in a way to see these numbers decrease um, during an economic downturn. You did note that it could be due to Medicaid uptake. Um, I was wondering if you would agree that it's also fair to assume that both bad debt and free care are down right now in comparison to overall revenue, because those who struggle the most to pay for health care are those who are most likely to avoid care. Um, I don't think I would agree with that. I, we open our doors to everybody, and, and uh, I, I don't, maybe somebody else has seen data to support that, but, but I'm not aware of any. That is not something that we've seen, um, but it, you know, uh, I mean, anything's possible. I mean, we have a great uh, rural transportation uh, service here that, that helps those that you know, may have difficulty getting to facilities. Uh, it's a great transportation service that uh, comes to all of our practices. So, you know, access should not be hindered by you know, not having transportation. Um, and certainly, we take everybody that uh, that comes. We have community okay. connections, which uh, is open okay. to patients um, to sign them up um, with uh, health plans. And uh, we actually have a fund that they can uh, get them services that they might not otherwise qualify for. So um, we really do uh, cater, actually, to um, disadvantaged folks that uh, and, and I think they've learned that this is a welcome medical community. So. I don't think I don't think that is a major issue here. OK, thank you. And just to be clear, I wasn't trying to um, say that you're you're trying to avoid low income patients. I was more referring to people with high deductibles or people that are uninsured, perhaps are the first groups to uh, okay. avoid care when when um, when there's economic issues. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. you. Know, yeah, no, our, our patient assistance program, I think, is, is, is good. We work hard with those patients if they don't qualify um, to extend payment terms, uh, and offer discounts. Um, so if they're delaying care, we're, we're not hearing about it. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we're going to go to public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer public comment on the Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital budget? Does any member of the public wish to offer comment? Hearing none, I wish to uh, Thank the team from Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital for um, a thorough presentation. And um, at this time, I would entertain a motion from a board member to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. And I'm glad that uh, it was, Sean, I've got to tell you that we've had some strange things at hospital hearings, but never a code silver. And uh, <laughs> the strangest one um, prior to this was when we were doing the hearings at the pavilion in Montpelier, when all of a sudden all the phones for the people from Gifford started pinging and Jayco had, had arrived in Randolph to do their um, annual unannounced un, uh, inspection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So need, need, needless to say, um, they were both troubling, but yours scared me more. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I, I will say the, the issue was resolved. Vermont State Police came quickly and uh, everybody's safe. But, uh, you know, that's.
I, I wish I could say that was an uncommon occurrence, but maybe that particular situation, but that's what we're dealing with today. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah, Thank you, you everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for your time.